Welcome back to Childhood Under Occupation, a podcast by Defence for Children International, Palestine. In this episode, we'll explore what education is like under occupation from the perspective of students and teachers. We'll also be joined by two of my colleagues in the West Bank, who work specifically on education-related child rights violations. One of them, Samir Ajaj. Samir Ajaj. Samir has been working for DCI Palestine for 14 years and is the coordinator of the Nablus office and the community mobilization unit. We're also joined by Wert al who's been with DCI Palestine for almost a year, coordinating a special project that documents rights violations related to education. He's also a lawyer. My name is Manar al Amle. I work um, as an international and local advocacy officer at DCIP. Manar is my counterpart in Palestine. I will be translating um, from Arabic to English and the other way around for this episode. No two days working at DCI Palestine are the same. So, for example, today Sami was following up with the colleagues on um, the updates um, of what uh, what was uh, what was happening in the uh, last period in the like last period, as well as um, planning and coordinating for the next uh, couple of weeks uh, for the initiatives and workshops and the videos they're um, planning to, to, to do. The workshops mentioned by Manar are part of a long-standing programme of community mobilisation and education delivered by DCI Palestine, in which we train children and their communities to understand their rights and document rights violations as they see them. The Community Mobilization Unit is a part of the uh, protection program, which is one of the main programs uh, at the DCIP. And their main goal is to uh, enhance the participation of children in um, the decision making in the Palestinian community. Well, Samir is responsible for a team that works mainly with children, um, and these children are um, considered protection teams, like they are uh, groups of protection teams. These protection teams and child-led data collection programs operate in five targeted areas of Palestine. It's a groundbreaking model of participation of children in the documentation of ongoing violations of their own rights. Through these programs, we empower children to become agents for positive change. Um, he coordinates with field researchers who document the violations um, on the uh, Palestinian children in school and how it affects their uh, education uh, process. He follows up with the field researchers on the latest violations um, on a daily basis. He reports for that and he uh, gives, like he writes at the end of the day, a report and send it to OCHA. In the West Bank, education is compulsory for children under 15. However, Israel's vast web of military checkpoints impedes the movement of all Palestinians, meaning that otherwise short journeys can take several hours. Consequently, Palestinian children may miss classes and extracurricular activities in addition to experiencing violence, intimidation and arbitrary arrest at checkpoints. Israeli forces also raid schools, at times throwing tear gas canisters into playgrounds full of children or raiding classrooms. Additionally, Palestinian children living near illegal Israeli settlements report being subjected to frequent harassment and violence as they travel to and from school. Settlers have also been known to attack schools with weapons during classes, creating an environment of fear at school that can impede the ability of children to learn and play. Most of the cases where there are violations on school and education happens um, and occur in the in Area C and in East Jerusalem as well as in Hebron. 77% of the cases happen in Area C, especially when schools are nearby or there is a an Israeli military camp by the school. The legal systems covering the three areas of the West Bank vary. In Area A, home to most West Bank cities, the Palestinian Authority has jurisdiction. Legal control over Area B is shared jointly by the PA and Israeli military. Area C, comprising 60% of the West Bank, falls under Israeli control. 
Israeli soldiers might uh, stop children where they are going to schools. They search them. Most of the time, make these children arrive late to schools. He also added that these, the infrastructure of these areas are very poor, which makes the children always go on foot to schools. Uh, no cars, like the infrastructure is not um, well uh, prepared for cars. And this results to these children being violated by Israeli uh, soldiers, that they are there um, and they see them on daily basis. بصراحة أنا يعني دخلت بدي أدخل هون في مثال سريع. So the incident Samir can recall is uh, he once was uh, at Al Sawiya Al Lubnan school, and during that time clashes occurred between the um, students and the Israeli military. When the Israeli forces were wandering around this school. Uh, Al Sawiya Al Lubnan school, and some of the students threw stones on them. And as a result, the Israeli forces surrounded the school and started uh, arresting some of these children, which at the end of the day stopped that day. When it comes to violations against schools and education, where it's, a, um, it's not only one type, there are um, different types of these violations. For instance, in the area of Aqraba, once there was someone who shot at Israeli forces, and as a result of this, the Israeli forces came to the area, they closed it as a militant area, and uh, in that area there are nine schools that were closed for three days and students were, were not able to um, study or go to these schools for three days. Also, um, Wert spoke about the violations in Area C. For instance, there are 50, 52 schools who are threatened to be demolished by Israeli forces because in Area C, in order for people to build a house or a school or, or any property, they need a permit from the Israeli um, authorities. And usually this either takes forever or doesn't happen at all. And people, as a result of this, they just build these properties. According to, to the Israeli authority, these 52 schools are not built legally, so they are threatened to be demolished. And there are 5,200 students who go to these schools. <laughs> Samir thinks that the violations, meanwhile, in these days are much, much more than um, when he used to be a student that, that was back in the 80s and 90s. And he thinks these violations make the obstacles and access to education much more difficult than when he was a student. يعني على سبيل المثال يعني Samer thinks the repetitive uh, violations, either like any type of the violations on education and schools, leaves um, its psychological effect on children, which sometimes make these children want to stop going to schools, and this happens. For him, this is the most important thing and the most important consequence that. The psychological effect can make children stop going to schools. As he said, we believe education is one of the most important things um, and it's a right for people to have. Children have the right to have a safe way to school. Uh, so he believes this is the most important thing that they have a safe road to and back from schools. <laughs> So what it says that the educational process in Palestine is exposed to many forms of violations and these might result of forbidding some of these children to continue their education or partially, um, um, you know, prevent them from uh, accessing to education or their schools. Um, and he believes that the international community should take its role in pressuring on Israel to stop these kind of violations. 
and guarantee the Palestinian children to have the right of education. Few people surely feel this as keenly as Palestinian school pupils and their teachers. We visited head teacher Yasser Ghazir, known to his pupils as Mr. Yasser, and one of his students, Amir Owais, at their school, El Sawya Luban Secondary School, in the northern occupied West Bank governorate of Nablus. The internet isn't the best, so please excuse the patchy audio. <laughs> So Amir is from a village called the Liban. They have so many agricultural uh, spaces. There are around 5,000 people living in the village. So a normal day for a child or a student in Liban is that they go back from school. They get lunch and they go uh, meet in the streets of the village, play either football or on the bike, just peacefully. Okay, Amir has seven to eight classes and his uh, favorite day is Thursday because they have the sports day and his favorite subject is sport and football and he loves his school because he can learn as well as he can you know spend some time with his friend and colleagues. Although school is clearly a joyful place for Amir, his journey to and from school is anything but. Well, he says that uh, usually the evaluations happen when they come to school or go back home from schools because Israeli soldiers as well as settlers might uh, attack them or even provoke them with gestures. Uh, sometimes uh, the soldiers follow them to their uh, villages when they are going back home. And he also mentioned that Sometimes violations happen inside the school where uh, Israeli soldiers raid the schools with their military vehicles. And this stops the education process because the teachers stop the classes that they're ha- giving for the students and go to deal with the soldiers. Recently, Amir and his friend were walking to school when they spotted an Israeli soldier and giggled at something he was doing. The soldier, accompanied by several others, followed Amir to school. Once in the playground, Amir managed to hide amongst the other children, but the soldiers decided to raid the school in search of him. For his own safety and the safety of the school, Mr Yasser had to send Amir home for the day. He was worried, he was really worried that something might happen to the school and he was to be blamed because All of the raid happened because he left. Despite his age, Amir is aware of the long-term impact the occupation will have on him and his classmates. The main aim of this is to keep this generation uneducated, but he believes that they will continue to learn and they come here every day, even if the raids happen and continue. They will come and learn because this is their goal. So Mr. Yasser says that this school was established in 1944, which means it was here even before the uh, state of Israel was established. It is a big school, an old school. Many generations graduated from here. There are a lot of olive trees surrounding the school. There are 420 students now uh, at this school studying. He said this is a truly beautiful school, but at the same time, it's at risk. And that's why they always talk to the Ministry of Education in order to make this school in a safe area or a safe school for students. We lost the connection with Mr. Yasser a little, but he told Manar about how in Palestine, education is considered an investment in the people. He said that very little has changed since he started working as a chemistry teacher in 2000. The only difference is that now, as a head teacher, he feels an even greater pressure to support his students to navigate the many impacts the occupation has on their education. These include harassment and violence from soldiers and settlers, lateness due to checkpoints and military incursions, and attacks on the school that reach the classrooms. He worries about the psychological impact on students and their ability to concentrate at school during lessons when they're constantly worried about their walk home. 
He worries about his teachers, who also face threats from armed soldiers. Recently, an Israeli soldier physically assaulted a teacher and pointed a gun at him. More recently, he said, the pandemic paralysed the education process, but even that was more manageable than the occupation. In September, Israeli soldiers arrested two students, one with mental health problems, and detained them for two days. Mr Yasser was standing at the school entrance between soldiers and children and had asked the soldiers to stand aside so that the children could pass into the school. Suddenly, he noticed a soldier had grabbed a child, so he ran to them and pulled the child free. Mr Yasser asked the soldiers to speak in Arabic or English and explain why they tried to take the boy, but they refused to engage with him unless he spoke in Hebrew, a language most Palestinians don't understand. Eventually, one of the soldiers told Mr Yasser that the boy had sworn at a soldier. Apparently, this had warranted three soldiers attacking the child. He managed to separate the soldiers from the rest of the students, but after some 15 minutes, an Israeli military vehicle raided the school. Again, Mr Yasser asked the soldiers why, and they told him a child had sworn at them. The teachers had to usher the children home through a side street for their safety. The soldiers then prevented all the teachers' cars from leaving the school for two hours, and they told Mr Yasser that they were closing the school. Incidents like this are sadly not uncommon in Palestine. But, despite his patchy internet connection, Mr Yasser did manage to tell us that he still has hope. My hope, my hope, I hope this school will be safe for, for all children. We are, uh, we are doing uh, our best uh, efforts to make it safe for the children. But, unfortunately, we can't do that because of the occupation. If you'd like to find out more about what education is like under occupation, please visit our website, dci-palestine.org. If you're a teacher, you'll soon find teaching resources there as well. To make sure you don't miss another episode, subscribe on your favourite podcast app. Thanks for listening.